And now for something completely different. Ah! Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. And good morning and welcome to the Halloween edition of The Real Investment Show. That's right, it's October 31st, wrapping up the month. And you younger parents, stop ruining Halloween. There is no such thing as a witch that shows up, takes your kid's candy, and leaves a present. No. <laughs> Let the kids eat the candy. <laughs> Although, I have to admit now that I'm older, our Halloween, our Halloween now consists of, we get a bunch of candy, right? We put it, we have this uh, like witch's cauldron type thing, and so my wife puts all the candy in the witch's cauldron. And then we shut off the porch light, lock the door, and watch a scary movie and eat candy. <laughs> so. I like that tradition. <laughs> so, this is the new Halloween. I'm too old to get up and down and answer the door anymore. <laughs> so, anyway, um, it is Halloween, of course. Uh, that also means that we're wrapping up the month, and uh, this this opens up a couple of opportunities. Uh, first of all, uh, the federal the federal open market committee, uh, Jerome Powell and his compatriots, are meeting today. Uh, tomorrow will be the announcement uh, for the next Fed rate hike or not. Expectations are basically right now that they will not hike rates and as such they won't. The, the, the Fed generally is not going to do something that the market is not already allowing them to do. So the market saying, hey, no Fed rate hikes here, unlikely that the Fed will hike rates tomorrow. Expect the same conversation. We talked about this yesterday um, that, you know, Thursday before last, uh, Jerome Powell was giving a speech to the Economic Council and basically, you know, said we're not hiking rates, but we're still, you know, we're still leaving an opportunity out there to hike rates if needed. And as we've said before, they're going to leave that out there. The reason is that when stock prices fall, this tightens monetary conditions. Why? Well, because falling stock prices make people very nervous. And that causes them to constrict spending, right? So if I constrict spending and slow economic activity, that is going to potentially bring down inflationary pressures. That was the opposite of what we saw from March to July, where we had this big rally in the markets, and that actually eased financial conditions and gave consumers confidence, right? Their 401k plans were worth more, they were doing well, so they're like, hey, I can spend some extra money because I'm making money in the markets. So again, what the Fed wants is these tighter financial conditions. That's doing the work for them so they don't need to hike rates, but they're not going to take that rate hike off the table ever. And the reason is, is they don't want the markets to immediately assume that the next action is going to be a rate cut. That would then turn to higher asset prices, easing financial conditions that potentially weighs in into inflation. So again, the Fed isn't going to do that. But the markets are kind of starting to sniff through this. Already expectations right now are that the Fed is going to hold rates here uh, probably into the first, second quarter of next year. First rate cut is going to be around July. And again, why is the Fed going to cut rates? They're not just going to cut rates for no reason, right? The Fed's going to start cutting rates when you have an economic slowdown. And importantly, if this deflationary pressure that they're looking for is now threatening to become much greater, right? So the Fed wants to keep inflation around 2%. We talked about this before, very important concept. The Fed wants inflation. So if gasoline is $4 a gallon in January, the next January, it's going to be 2% higher. So you're not going to get cheaper gasoline prices. You're not going to get cheaper food prices. You're not going to get cheaper car prices. That's not what the Fed wants. Cheaper prices are deflation, right? And that's much more of a symptomatic relationship with recessions and potentially deeper recessions. So they don't want that, right? They want the economy to grow. They want stability. They want financial stability, and particularly in the markets, but they want inflation of 2%. So they're not trying to get to cheaper prices. So if you're expecting to have cheaper prices, that's not going to occur. What they want is 2% inflation, not 4 So. Over the next 12 months, they're going to hold interest rates here, expect that rate, the, that inflation rate to come down. If it begins to get out of hand, that's when they start cutting rates. That's to create economic activity to start bringing up the rate of inflation. So if we start cutting rates next July, 
that is probably going to be coincident with a much slower economic environment, potentially a recessionary. And that certainly doesn't jive with these expectations right now for corporate earnings, which are expected to grow sharply in 2024. You can't have growing earnings in a slowing economic environment. Those two just don't live together. So again, it's kind of an interesting conundrum that what the markets are expecting on one hand in terms of stock prices is, is interesting because that doesn't jive with the economic forecast of lower interest rates next year. We'll see what happens, but it's something, something certainly worth paying attention to. Uh, so yesterday, so here's what you need to know before the bell. Yesterday we were talking about this, that the market was deeply oversold here very nice rally yesterday. Market was up a little over 1% yesterday. We'll see if we get uh, some follow through. Now, this is going to be the important thing. This morning, uh, futures on the S&P are up about 10 points. We need some follow through here to confirm that yesterday's rally was, you know, not just a trick. It was a treat, right? So we need, you know, it's kind of a trick or treat issue for the markets. Markets need to have a follow through rally today. And that will suggest that this recent sell off may be short term over. The problem that the markets are going to have here over the next couple of weeks, and I would certainly expect a rally that would last a couple of days, maybe even a week, is that we're going to quickly run into uh, resistance right here at the 200 day moving average, which we broke earlier last week. So again, that's going to be the first level of resistance market rallies back to about 4230. That's also going to coincide with a 20 day moving average, which is going to intersect with that 200 day moving average as well. So there's a cluster of resistance that is building right at that level. If we can get back above the 200 day moving average, now that'll be bullish. That'll suggest your year end rally is, is certainly intact. But again, unfortunately, that's going to line up and it's going to be impacted by the 50 day moving average, which is going to be around 4250. So somewhere between here and 4250 is likely the, the optimal trade at this moment for the markets. And so if we start to get back up to this 4250 level, that's probably a good area to start reducing some risk, raising a bit of cash here. If you haven't liked this decline, right, this has been more impactful to your, to your portfolio than you wanted. That's going to be a good level around 4250, 4260 to potentially reduce some risk in your portfolio. It's also going to be the top of this downtrend channel that we've been building in the markets over the course of the last uh, couple of months. So again, you know, work that process, work that channel for right now. If we break out of that channel to the upside, then, well, we've got higher prices ahead and we'll have to make some adjustments at that point. But for right now, uh, we seem to be really kind of confined to this particular channel in the markets. So pay attention to the risk. Again, there's some opportunity going into the year. Stock buybacks are really going to start in earnest next week. This week, we've got Apple. Uh, basically, about 80% of the S&P 500 will have, been, uh, will have reported earnings by the end of this week. So we're going to have a really good handle on earnings. Stock buybacks open up in November. You typically get some buying in November and December. And again, that'll probably put us within this channel uh, that we have currently. Now, once we get to January of next year, it's kind of a whole different game. So we'll figure out what happens uh, to the markets when we get there. But for right now, pay attention to that um, um, and, and manage your risk accordingly. That's what you need to know before the bell this morning. When we come back, lots of stuff to get into, um, you know, relating to really some of this economic data that's coming out and potentially, potentially what 2024 is going to look like. So we'll talk about that some more when we come back from the break. It's The Real Investment Show. Happy Halloween. Be right back. news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Is this the Butterball Turkey Hotline? No, Janet. This isn't turkey talk. It's Talking Turkey. Our next Candid Coffee, Saturday, November 4th. Richard Rosso and Danny Ratliff will take your questions about the beefs you've had about money this year and the personal finance pitfalls that really cooked your goose and some end-of-year money ideas to prepare you for 2024. Beef? Goose? I thought it was turkey. 
Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com. Talk in Turkey about your money with Ratliff and Rosso. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN, or again, simply online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Small businesses are discovering that attracting and retaining top talent come down to more than just salary. In today's highly competitive job market, compensation is more than just wages. Hi, I'm Tom Allen. RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Healthcare and retirement plans can make the difference in hiring and retaining the best employees. We can show you how to build an affordable, effective employment package that delivers true value for your workers and your business. Call me toll free at 855-RIA plan or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show this morning. It is uh, early this morning. And, um, you know, it's interesting because I'm getting a lot of emails right now talking about the markets and, you know, how bad things are and, you know, super bearish attitudes, etc. And this is exactly what I told you was going to happen back in June. So back in June and July, we were writing articles about how the market was very overbought and you should expect a 5 to 10% correction in the markets. And then when that happened, which by the way, these 5 to 10% corrections are absolutely normal in any given year. And I told you then that when it occurred that everybody's going to get super bearish, they're going to assume the world's coming to an end, you know, those type of things. And here we are. Market's down, was down. As of Friday, the market was down 10% from the peak. All right? Feels terrible. I get it. Right? Feels terrible. Feels awful. But it's normal. You should expect that. The market was up 50. I want you to put some things into perspective. Let's use the long-term historical average, and let's just assume that the media people are right and the market grows at 8% every single year. Okay? The market was up 15% in July for the year, almost double the historical average. Right now, the market's still up 7% for the year, right? You're still within the historical average even after this sell-off. So perspective is always a very important aspect of your portfolio. You know, we love it when it's going up, right? I mean, when markets are up 15%, it's like, oh, this ain't ever going to stop. We're going to be up 30% at this rate by the end of the year. Yeah, but that's not normal. You've got to expect the corrections, you know, along the way. So it's just like anything, right? I mean, you can have a whole stretch of sunny days and you're eventually going to get some rain, right? I mean, it's just, that's the, you know, if you have, <laughs> you know, put it this, you know, that's probably a really great analogy. Um, you know, you think about it, right? We all love sunny days, right? And if we have a string of sunny days that last indefinitely, we wind up with a desert, right? You got to have some rain. And the same thing for the markets. Markets are, you know, if they're going up, that's awesome. But that creates other problems. So you've got to have these corrections in order to, you know, give the markets a bit of a breather. It also gives you an opportunity to put some money to work. Right at better prices, so you've got to keep things in perspective. And this, and look, I seem to be hitting this a lot lately. You know, I just wrote this article uh, over the weekend talking about possibilities and probabilities. 
because I'm just getting so many emails right now from people that are just, you know, so detached from what happens historically in the financial markets. And you're going to make a mistake, right? And, and we see this happen over and over and over again in history. You know, uh, you know, we've talked about this on the show numerous times it is, you know, in, in bear markets, people get out of the markets and then it takes them years to get back into the market because after the, you know, when the markets are in a bear market, they're convinced it's only going to go down further. And then when it starts rallying, they're convinced that, well, it's just a short term blip and it's going to go back down again. So they don't want to be in the markets. And so they miss four or five years of the rally and they wind up buying back in at the top and you know what happens next. And this is why, you know, the buy high, sell low is a real problem for investors over time. And it's hard to navigate that. I get it, right? It's emotional. It's grinding. When markets are going down, it's terrible. Trust me, I suffer with that too, right? I don't like it when markets decline. It's, it's you know, it makes for a bad day. But it's part of the process, and, you know, sometimes it's just a challenge. And this year, look, and this year has been very challenging, right? We've talked about before, if you've owned any other stocks other than the top seven, you haven't made any money this year. And, and now the markets, you know, outside of those top seven stocks are negative for the year. And that's difficult, right? Because you look at the index and why the index is doing great. Well, my, my portfolio is not. Why? Because you own other stocks. But this is the challenge that we have to go through as investors. And, and there's a, you know, this is, you know, a, a, a mistake that investors are making right now is piling into money market funds and piling into short term CDs and banknotes, treasuries. It's a mistake. And the reason is, is like, yeah, I can get 5% on my money market right now. So why be invested in the stock market? I can go buy some five-year, you know, some one-year or two-year T-bills with a 5% yield on them. Yeah, you can. What are you going to do next? Because very quickly, that 5% money market rate is going to go back to zero. That's just a function of time. When that T-bill matures at 5%, it's going to go back to zero. So what are you going to do then? And the problem is, is that by the time that occurs, the markets are going to be running off to the moon and you're going to be trying to figure out how to switch assets. And now you're back into the trap of, well, I was in this risk-free asset and now the markets are just running up and it's stupid. It doesn't make any sense. Value is too, the valuations are too high. There's too much debt. The deficit's too big. We're in a recession, whatever it is. There'll be, you know, a thousand reasons why you don't want to buy into the stock market. And so you're going to sit there. And 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 the market's going to keep going. And it's, this happens all the time. It happened after the crash in, in, in 2001 and two. It happened in the, after the crash in 2008. It happened after the crash in 1933. People spend a, an inordinately long amount of time. In, in the, after the crash of 1974, it was called the Black Bear Market. Um, the headlines said that you were asking if stocks were dead in 1974. People believe that. People didn't come back into the stock market until almost 1990. Because, see, these events, when they occur like the depression, like the crash of 29 and the banks fail. People don't try, they've lost a ton of money. So they don't trust the financial markets. They don't trust the banks, whatever it is, but they, they say, you know, I, I, I'm not doing that again. Right. You know, it's, it's, I got stung in the financial markets. I can tell you right now that I know people who lost 50% of their money in 2008, never got back in the stock market again. That's okay. That's their choice, right? But this is how we react as human beings, right? It's our, it's our conscious decisions that we make because of a bad event. And you stick your hand on a hot stove and it burns you and you go, well, I'm never doing that again. 
that's probably a good response, but it's the same, same thing with the financial markets. We get hurt. We don't do things again. I, I, have, I have a friend of mine who, this was 40 years ago now. He was married. His wife cheated on him. It's terrible. It, it was a terrible, they were a terrible couple. It was a terrible relationship. All they did was fight cats and dogs, but he but she literally broke his heart to the point that he never had a relationship again with another female. I'm he never had a relationship, period. <laughs> I don't want to make an implication. <laughs> I gotta be you have to be careful these days. But the point was is that it broke him psychologically. Super nice guy. But made the decision, I am never going through that pain again. And the same thing happens in the financial markets when people lose a lot of money. It's like, I'm never going to do that again. I'm just going to go put my money in a bank account and, you know, just be fine. That's okay. There's nothing. And let me, let me just state to you, you don't have to invest in the financial markets. Right? Right? I know plenty of people that don't invest in financial markets. They just save a bunch of money. And, and remember, how do we build wealth, right? We build wealth by saving money. We don't build wealth by investing. Now, I know that seems counterintuitive, but follow me here. You build wealth by saving money. You don't build it by investing in the market. So financial markets are a function of making sure the savings that you have are growing with the rate of inflation over time so that your purchasing power parity remains the same. What you should be focusing on is running your business, starting a business, growing your wealth that way. Or saving, just saving a bunch of money, creating a lot of free cash flow, those type of things. Whatever your business is, right? You can you can start a business of rental homes, creating cash flow, and then you take that cash flow and you save that, and then you use the financial markets to adjust for that those savings for inflation. However, you get there is fine. You won't find many, if any, people that got rich slow just solely investing in the, in the stock market. Like they started out with a hundred bucks and they invested it and they became rich doing that. And, and keep and kept it. You, there are people that have done that and then they lose it all. But even people that make their money have made billions investing. Ray Dalio, Warren Buffett. They did that using other people's money. Their wealth came from investing for other people. That's their business that made them wealthy. So, you know, you've got to always keep this in mind that when we're talking about taking risk, and investing, it is a risk, and there's a risk of loss. So we have to manage that risk. But you can't make these decisions that lead to catastrophic outcomes because of emotional biases. Be right back after the break. Real Investment Advice blog. It's required reading for the informed investor. Catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com. Is this the Butterball Turkey Hotline? No, Janet. This isn't turkey talk. It's talking turkey. Our next Candid Coffee, Saturday, November 4th. Richard Rosso and Danny Ratliff will take your questions about the beefs you've had about money this year and the personal finance pitfalls that really cooked your goose and some end-of-year money ideas to prepare you for 2024. Beef? Goose? turkey register now at realinvestmentadvice.com talking turkey about your money with ratliff and rosso realinvestmentadvice.com health and financial security touches everyone within your organization 
Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. My wife is the worst when it comes to Tupperware. She can never put the Tupperware lid on the actual container when she puts it away. So we have this drawer that's a hodgepodge of just Tupperware bottoms and Tupperware tops. The Real Investment Show podcast. Same show, your schedule. In the back of this drawer is the lid that goes to this particular container. So I reach in very quietly. I get it. I put the lid on it and I walk out of the kitchen. By the time I get to the living room i hear aha and she's got this piece of saran wrap off the wrapper now it's all like mangled up the edges are all ragged and it's all wrinkled in the middle and it's kind of stuck together as she's holding up she's so proud of herself she turns around to put it on the container and it's sitting there with the lid on it. the real investment show podcast and then came the string of profanity and the saran wrap came throwing out of the kitchen at me at realinvestmentadvice.com did nothing i just put the lid on the container Anyway, I'm filing for husband abuse. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Real Investment Show podcasts are now available on iTunes. Listen anyplace, anytime at iTunes.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. It's a quick and easy application. Just simply click Ask a Question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all our videos ready for your easy access. Now with the new and improved Before the Bell reports, plus each day's radio shows, subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. So welcome back to the show. So look, kind of just wrapping up our conversation from the last segment. The, the point that I'm trying to make and, and is that we make mistakes emotionally by making blanket decisions. And there's all kinds of reasons why we can come up with certain decisions kind of in the heat of the moment type thing. And, you know, again, like in this past weekend's newsletter, I was writing about possibilities and probabilities and something that we talked about on the show uh, last week, early last week, which is why, what kind of spurred the idea for the article. But, you know, when we talk about these things, right, we come up with, and again, we talk, we've talked about, you know, all the different psychological th- problems that we go through and all the different reasons why certain things occur. And, these are these are important, Brent. So these are these psychological reasons are important because they affect our thinking process, right? And so whether it's hurting or whether it's loss aversion or whatever it is, these psychological factors, they impede our ability. And so I, I built this chart in last weekend's newsletter using standard deviations. And you know, putting into trying to put into perspective these more extreme risks that people are thinking. You know, and right now it's just headlines everywhere. The you know, it's the, you know the debts and the deficits. It's World War Three. It's it's the you know the collapse of the currency. It's the demise of democracy. You know, whatever it is, right? 
these these more extreme events, and we talked about this last week, being tail events, you know, are really far out there on the curve. Can they happen? Yes, right? There's a possibility that these can happen. But they're so far out on the curve that they are very low probability events. Right? They can happen, though, right? We had a Great Depression back in 1933. Right? We had a financial crisis. You know, we haven't had economic Armageddon yet. <laughs> right? So those things, and, and look, this isn't the first, I mean, y'all, you know, you know the 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 media crowd and the people that are doing interviews and they're talking about the end of the the end of civilization as we know it they're not new right these have been around for you know these people have been around since the 1970s right we were building bunkers for nuclear fallout back in the 60s and 50s because people we, we were convinced that you know Nuclear war was coming. So, you know, building bunkers in your backyard is not a new thing. But that event hasn't occurred yet. On the same, on, on, on the other side of the, the, the equation, of course, is, you know, economic perfection. There are people like, oh, this is great. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. It's, you know, that's, that's not a real probability of it anyway. So, you know, we have to just focus on the large chunk of probabilities and possibilities that lie in, in the middle of that deviation of outcomes. And we have to manage that risk accordingly. And, and yes, can you hedge for those tell risks? Yeah, absolutely. If, you're, if you think that there's a risk that we're going to wind up in nuclear war, as an example, then you just buy some, some long-dated out-of-the-money puts in, uh, on the S&P in your portfolio. And if that event would occur, it's going to cost you some money. It's like car insurance. Right, cost you some money, but in the event that everything goes to hell in a handbasket, those things will pay off and it'll keep all your money intact. Odds are, though, you're probably going to spend money and just lose it because those outcomes generally never occur. So the point is just controlling your emotions, keeping those emotional biases in check. And saying, look, I, I, I'm really worried about this, but let me set this in a box over here and I'll just kind of keep a watch on it. And if it really starts to develop, then I'll shift. And then manage the portfolio for what you have right now. And you'll wind up doing better over time. But it's difficult, right? And, and I, you know, it's, it's very difficult because there's so many negative headlines and as we talked about in the newsletter you know the, the the old argument that if it bleeds it leads that's all you hear on the tv right now it's whether it's cnb cnn or you know fox news or whatever channel that you decide to watch it's nothing but bad news it's nothing but you know economic you know despair and you know, war and, and uh, you know, everybody hates everybody. I mean, it's it's miserable to watch the news. I mean, if you would just like being depressed, watch the news because you'll just be depressed. And it doesn't matter what channel you watch. <laughs> so, you know, that's the problem. But that's what drives views. That's what drives clicks. And that's why you see, you know, websites and you see, you know, video headlines. You know, it's, it's the end of the world as we know it. Click here for more. And so you click it. You want to read it. Why is, why is the world about to end? And you wind up sitting in your bunker. Just be careful is the whole point about this. And, and again, you know, we've got a lot of stuff that's ahead of us that is not going to be helpful <laughs> for any of this, right? We're going to have some economic problems next year. We're going to have a slower economic environment. Does that mean the world is, is going to end as we know it? No. Does it mean the market's going to decline? Probably. Does it mean it's going to crash and take away all your money? Probably not. So this is what we have to navigate. And, and when is this going to be over? Well, you know, surefire signs that this will be over is when the Fed starts cutting rates and starts reversing QT back to QE.
they're gonna they're gonna fall back to that same playbook that we've been using since 2008 because it seemed to work then. So they'll hope it works now, and it probably will. At least for the financial markets, right? It doesn't make economic prosperity better. It doesn't you know it doesn't create a wider swath of economic equality. It, do, it only, you know, it boosts the wealth of the rich. It extracts capital from the middle class and shifts it to the wealthy and it just kills the poor. Yes, that is going to be the ongoing outcome of the situation. We will continue to issue more debt. And yes, probably sometime after our lifetime is over, the debt will become a problem. But it's probably not going to be today. You know, I thought it was interesting because there is, you know, a lot of concern right now about what's happening in the Middle East and what's happening in, you know, the you know between Russia, Ukraine, et cetera. And, you know, this is just given kind of the media headlines, just tons of fodder for how this could expand into World War Three. And yeah, and that's certainly a possibility. Somebody kind of you know, goes off the rail, starts launching missiles into other countries, and then, you know, allies are going to respond. And it, it, could, it, could, it could expand very fast. I'm, I'm, I'm re-watching The Band of Brothers right now on uh, Netflix. Uh, it was an HBO series put together by Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks. It's, it's an awesome series. If you haven't watched it, I um, highly encourage you to do it. But it's about World War II and the invasion of Normandy D-Day. And it's this, you know, this troop, uh, Easy Company, and it's the story about their endeavors. And again, as you know, as I watch this, you know, this was that moment where we got dragged, really got dragged. You know, it started with Pearl Harbor. Obviously, that's what dragged us in to World War II. And, you know, the Germans had to just hate the Japanese <laughs> because if, if the Japanese would have just left us alone, we wouldn't have gotten involved in World War II. And, you know, very likely most of Germany would be, uh, most of Europe would be speaking German, you know, now. But a very different outcome potentially, um, you know, how the world political powers would be today had Japan not attacked us and drug us into World War II. And once we got dragged into, you know, World War II, then, you know, obviously we started supporting our allies in, in Europe. You know, a very different breed of man back then as well. You know, these, these guys that served and, and, I, and I'm not taking anything away from our current combat veterans as well, but just a very different breed of person that served in the military back then and the stuff that they went through. So it's a fascinating series. If, if you haven't watched Band of Brothers, certainly encourage you to do it. Um, and it's, and they, they interview people from Easy Company in World War II prior to each episode. And then they tell you what happened at the end of each episode with those individuals, you know, who got bronze crosses and who got medals of valor, et cetera. So again, this is very fascinating stuff. But even that, that, that was World War, right? That was the outcome that everybody's expecting now. Minus the nukes. You know what the markets did during that period? Go back and look. It wasn't the end of the financial markets. All right, come back from the break. Don't go away. We'll uh, get ready to wrap up the show, get you started for the day right here on The Real Investment Show. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com.
Is this the Butterball Turkey Hotline? No, Janet, this isn't Turkey Talk. It's Talking Turkey, our next Candid Coffee, Saturday, November 4th. Richard Rosso and Danny Ratliff will take your questions about the beefs you've had about money this year and the personal finance pitfalls that really cooked your goose and some end-of-year money ideas to prepare you for 2024. Beef? Goose? I thought it was turkey. Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com. Talk in Turkey about your money with Ratliff and Rosso. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN at realinvestmentadvice.com. Small businesses are now being challenged by the lack of employees and how to attract and recruit the best employees. To get the better employee, you'll have to offer a better package. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Don't assume a 401k plan is too costly or complicated for your small business to offer. Let us show you how to make the most of an affordable and effective plan that will deliver true value for your business and your employees. Call me toll-free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. A passive investment portfolio requires active risk management. It's not a choice, it's necessity. Diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss. Let us actively help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. So today, uh, Caterpillar announced earnings this morning, um, better than, uh, kind of much better than expected on stronger construction demand. Uh, that is that Inflation Reduction Act, you know, kicking through. Um, a lot of money being spent there to, you know, build out, and also the, the Chips Act as well. A lot of money there, you know, build out property, plants, you know, those type of things, bring manufacturing back. So that all requires construction. So, you know, lots of demand for tractors and construction equipment uh, from Caterpillar. So their earnings were good. Stock's been under a bit of pressure, obviously, because of just the overall market and, you know, potential weakness in the economy going forward. And and this is the big question is, that's great, right? We've had fantastic earnings this quarter because of all this money that we threw, you know, through these you know, the Inflation Reduction Act and through the CHIPS Act, et cetera, billions of dollars being put out there to, you know, do stuff. Question is, what are you going to do for me next, right? What's what's going to be the next driver of more sales? Because once I bought a tractor, you know, I don't need to buy a tractor for every project, right? (laughs) You know, once I, once I'm, you know, if I'm a construction company and I get a big project and I go, oh, I need uh, I need two more tractors, right? So I go buy two more tractors or, a, or you know, bulldozer or whatever it is that I need, you know, dump truck, whatever. Whatever I go out and I buy, I now have that in my inventory, so I don't need to buy it for the next project. Odds are if I have a really big project and then I don't have another project, I may wind up, you know, selling that equipment or renting it out, doing something else with it. So the question becomes, what's going to be the next driver for an acceleration in construction that requires me, so I have my normal demand, right? So I have all the equipment I need for my normal demand. So I have this new thing that comes along that gives me an outsized demand for the equipment I have. But then after that, I'm going to go back to my normal demand. So now I've got excess equipment potentially just kind of sitting around idle. So the question we have to ask is, and I don't have the answer, by the way, just the question to ask though is is what's going to be the next driver for caterpillar cells if you don't have any more inflation reduction acts or chips acts or you know whatever it is coming out of the government spending process um also you have pfizer uh pfizer basically getting hit by weak covid cells um, also, a lot of write-offs in the their vaccines. 
that stock's been under a tremendous amount of pressure. So all the run-up that Pfizer had prior to, or I should say post-2019, has now been given up, right? All the, all the gains that the stock made in price pre-COVID, there's basically back now to pre-COVID levels. All that's been reversed. So that whole COVID boost, <laughs> the whole COVID booster, <laughs> as, as now run its course. And, and, and so it's going to be interesting to, to see because now Pfizer's got to come up with something new to drive sales. Uh, Amgen also reporting today, Anheuser-Busch, um, of course, that's, you know, they've been wrestling with a whole Bud Light fiasco. Uh, interestingly enough, there is now a push to boycott UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Championship uh, group because they they cut a deal with Bud Light. Bud Light's trying to restore their brand, right? Get back to their roots of guys that like to watch football and ultimate fighting and you know all those type of things. They're trying to get back to their core base and <laughs> I guess apologize, but they cut a hundred a hundred million dollar deal with UFC uh, to be the you know the sponsor of UFC. To be, you know, so Bud Light's now the sponsor of UFC. Um, but now there's a push to boycott UFC because of their relationship with Bud Light. So Bud Light just can't get away from this whole Dylan Mulvaney thing. They're just they're trying to they're trying to restore their brand, but they just can't get away from that whole fiasco that they got themselves into um, previously. So it, it'll you know this is not going to be you know it, it'll be interesting to see in this report if they are starting to push past that bad PR campaign and if sales are starting to stabilize and, and that, um, you know, we'll see. Uh, Marathon Petroleum, Caesar Entertainment, Franklin Resources, First Solar, Match Group. Um, of course, Match Group owns all the dating sites. There's some jokes in there. I'm just going to leave alone for right now so I don't get uh, banned off air. Um <laughs> Uh, Cisco Foods uh, also reports today, Paycom, Thomson Reuters, uh, Yum Brands, and uh, Zebra Technologies. Uh, Yum Brands is also going to be interesting to watch. Yum is the spinoff from Pepsi, which owns Kentucky Fried Chicken, Pizza Hut, and Taco Bell. So it'll be interesting to watch Yum Brands in general, uh, also Yum China, which is the one that reports today, to see how fast food sales are holding up relative to higher prices because it's just getting it's it's just expensive to go eat out right i mean it's you know fast cheap fast food no longer exists it, it may be fast food but it's expensive um and and, and that's just can get worse so it'll be interesting to see how effectively that young brands both in china and in the u.s are able to pass on those higher costs and if demand is still holding up for those products so that'll be something worth watching. Um, tomorrow, uh, we're going to get, uh, again, this whole week is, we've got 20% of the S&P reporting early this week. So, I mean, it's just it's just a, a deluge of earnings that are coming in. You know, we're going to be getting Apple this week, Airbnb, DoorDash is tomorrow, CVS, um, PayPal, Roku, Estee Lauder, uh, Apollo Global, Zillow um, reports tomorrow, Wayfair, Brinker. MetLife, Norwegian Cruise Lines, Kraft Heinz, DuPont, Etsy. I mean, again, the list just goes on and on and on. So this week is going to be really kind of a telltale sign of just how stable earnings and earnings growth are. And again, what we're, watch, what we're watching right now is the earnings downgrades. In other words, analysts that are coming out downgrading earnings is outpacing earnings upgrades. So uh, we've said before that earnings estimates going into 2024 were way too high and they'd have to come down. Those are coming down. And they're going to continue to come down as we get further into 2024 because that year-end estimate for 2024 is way too high. It's outside of norms. So it's not surprising we're seeing these earnings downgrades and we're going to continue to see that. But it's already starting to show up. You know, there's a lot of excitement that Q3 the earnings season that we're in right now is the trough 
of the earnings decline that started in 2022. And that starting next quarter, earnings are going to start to grow and grow rather rapidly. That's the expectation. Now, we'll see if that's going to happen, um, but I doubt it. And again, if, if the Fed is cutting rates, I can guarantee you that earnings are not growing at that rapid rate going into next year. Because if they're cutting rates, there's something else going on you know, within the overall economy. So the, this is just kind of things to keep a watch out for. And again, you know, the, the big news really tomorrow is going to be watching the FOMC. Friday is the employment report. So we've got the October employment report this coming Friday. I always have to get my month straight. We have to get the, we get the, the October employment report. Now, remember, we just came off a scorching employment number last month. 339,000 jobs. Now, most of that was temporary work. Most of it was, you know, uh, low-end wage earners, those type of things. It was a lot of staffing up for the holiday, you know, for the Halloween shopping, you know, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it, but again, we still have staffing up for, you know, Black Friday right around the corner. And Black Friday is no longer Black Friday. It's Black Week because we started a week early <laughs> and it goes a week after. <laughs> And so we all count it as one day. It's all Black Friday, but we just count two weeks worth of sales as one day. Uh, but no, we're gonna have staff up for that because people can go out and do shopping, you know, for their you know Christmas. And then we got Christmas right around the corner. So we're gonna potentially see a continued kind of strength in employment in that retail kind of leisure hospitality space because of the holidays that we're moving into. So we've got that now. Understand though, the the Fed, the Federal Reserve, they're meeting today and they'll have their announcement tomorrow. They already know this employment number. They already know the number. It's already been given to them. So when they're meeting, they're going, yeah, we've already know this number. It's gonna this number is gonna be you know two hundred eighty thousand or whatever the number is, right? They know what it is, and so you expect a mention in the FOMC report that because of a strong, you know, labor market and a strong economy, those type of things, that's because they already know the, they, they already know the number. And that's why we're leaving one rate hike sitting out there on the table because we already know the number and it's going to be strong. Now, if they happen to say something like due to a sudden downshift in economic activity, right, or something like that, or because of signs of, you know, uh, weakness in the employment environment, they already know that number. So there's going to be a, there's going to be a potential for us to to get some clues about that employment number from what the Fed says on tomorrow afternoon. So again, it'll all be worth watching. Um, anyway, keep a watch on the markets. Futures are up this morning um, a little bit. We need a follow through day. So what would be great is this morning we have a kind of a flattish open, which is what it looks like right now, and then we kind of build into the afternoon. Um, bond yields kind of hold their ground, uh, not go up. Uh, even some lower bond yields today would be, be fine heading into the meeting um, and help lift the market. So again, we need a follow through day to confirm that yesterday's rally was a treat and not a trick. So we'll see what happens today. In the meantime, have a very happy Halloween. Be careful driving around tonight. Halloween is the highest incident rate for child auto collisions. So be careful driving around. Kids running out in front of your car. Be careful. But have a happy Halloween. We'll see you back here tomorrow on the next edition of The Real Investment Show.